so we're ready to go. So yeah, we're just um, picking up where we left off. Um, where we left, I guess. Um, so yeah, we defined um, this language here. So it's a simply type lambda calculus where we added. Um, oh yeah, I also forgot the unit, but it's not so important. So where we you know added lists basically and also fixed points yeah, and with list comes uh, uh, nil, cons and the pattern match and then we defined yet another dynamics um, uh, we had this tick construct and uh, tick would kind of like um, increment or decrement this uh, resource counter here in the dynamics so there's like yet another way uh, to get stuck by running out of uh, resources and um, then we started um, to um, define this type system for resource analysis where we have the um, potentials um, we are stored in lists and we also have these constant potentials Q and Q prime um, around. So um, I got a question like why is it called um, amortized um, analysis? Um, uh, well, the, the reason is because you can do with this a lot of this um, amortized reasoning and um, if you look at the classic um, amortized analysis in textbooks, um, it is also an analysis to get a worst case bound. So you, if you look at one um, operation, you have the amortized cost of this operation, but you use it as a tool to get a worst case bound on a sequence of operations. So this is basically the, the same thing that we are doing. Um, so, and I will, um, show you an example um, tomorrow where you know you have a real kind of like amortized reasoning going on a functional queue. Um, okay, so and then there was a, a lot of um, confusion and a lot of questions about um, the um, lambda abstraction rule. Let me write it again. So um, this is how it looked. So, so this is kind of like what we expect. Uh, P prime the function body has to have type tau prime, and then we added. Um, this additional requirement that we're not allowed to um, capture any potential. And so I said, like, yeah, okay, I don't define it, but now I want to define it um, because there were so many questions and it's really not hard to define it. So mainly we remove the uh, potential from the lists. Yeah, so that's also, I, mean, I, I didn't say it correctly, we don't remove it from the function. So let me just write it. So um, if you have unit, you don't do anything. If you have the function arrow, uh, you don't do anything neither. Yeah, you leave uh, the potential annotations in there because the goal is to have um, the potential zero um, for uh, the value um, um, that has like this type. Um, and so the only case where something happens is where we have a potential annotation. I mean, for lists, um, also something happens. Now we just pass this on in contrast to the function arrow, and um, where we do the real work is here. If we have such an annotation, a Q here, then um, we replace it with zero and do that inductively also for this type tau. Okay, and for um, a context, maybe I squeeze it in here. Yeah, and that's also another confusion uh, that arises because um, yeah, you have these a's, and then you also have these types um, tau, um, and kind of like I always um, 
um, define these like mutual recursive functions. Yeah, so it's kind of like a type error because um, they are kind of like defined on both of these objects on the A's and the Tau's. Yeah, so I should kind of like have two different names, right? So this here is the one for for Tau's, and this here is the one for A's. But yeah, leave that out. And I overload it even more. I still I have the same. Um, um, kind of like two bar symbol even for the for the contexts. So if you have an empty context, um, then yeah, you just get the empty context. And if you have a x tau gamma, so then you just erase the potential from the tau and do the rest. Uh, do the same for the uh, rest uh, in in gamma. So that's the definition of that. Yeah, question. Yeah, so um, typical example is um, a pend. Um, I don't want to... Yeah, right. I guess the joke is small. Like, like I, I can understand the, the abstract notion of the append thing, but it would, like, it would be useful if there was like, a concrete right. Right, right, okay, let's see. So um, let's say we have something like this. Um, so... That's probably the simplest one, um, at least I can think of. Um, and then you want to return x, right? So the type you really want to give to it is something like this. Um, yeah, because like you're in a context where you maybe later want to perform some computation on that x that really costs something. So um, the type you really would like to give it, yeah, but this is not possible, it's something like this. So you have some potential on the first list on x, and then here we don't really care about this one, yeah, so let's say it's zero. Um, and um, what you wanna get out here is potential one, because you don't do anything with x, you just pass it along, so that should be possible. But this is uh, prohibited by this rule, yeah, because if you, um, you know, we don't have a let, but let's say, you know, we, we had it, I mean, we can simulate it, so uh, let's call this function f, and so um, if you would use this function f and um, you would, um, yeah, first um, apply it to some list, you know, let's say, and um, so, let g equals um, f of you know, some list. And then um, you were to use it twice, right? So you were um, to do something like this, yeah? So then, um, so which you can't do right now because we have a, a linear type system, but this is something I wanna allow later on. Um, but I can't do because then, um, so now you could type, so the, the the cost of this, um, oh yeah, well, I mean, okay, we, we, don't, we don't have a cost, yeah, so we would have to have like some um, um, other function that um, consumes the result. Um, yeah, so this really doesn't work, so yeah, we would have some other function that um, um, has some cost, right, and H, let's say, right, and we would um, use now G of the empty list twice. Yeah, let's say, you know, we would have something like this. So then we would only pay once for this potential here, which has cost two, yeah, and then we wouldn't pay anymore because, yeah, here, yeah, we don't feed anything in, and we get twice here um, out a list 
um, that is worth kind of like potential two. So we would have to have paid four at the beginning, but we didn't do it. So um, we can't allow that really. Yeah. If, you know, let's say the type of age is you know, something like, like this. Yeah, so that would be kind of like yeah, un unsound to do. Yeah, you would get the bound two, but the real bound would be four. Um, yeah, and of course you can say like yeah, um, you you don't add this requirement, um, you leave it out, but then um, you have to treat the functions as linear objects. You can't kind of like use them twice, um, which is annoying if you have like a recursive function, for instance. So it's really something you, you don't want. Then the functions would carry potential, and then you can't really define them with a, a fixed point anymore. Yeah, because in this rule, you require that the type tau doesn't have any potential. Yeah, so that wouldn't work anymore then, um, if you were to allow the potential in the functions. So this is the reason, and yeah, this um, yeah, whole thing is a bit annoying um, yeah, to, to deal with. But then um, it's not so bad um, in the end, because um, you know, that since functions don't have potential, so you can always partially apply functions to uh, um, um, high order arguments. Yeah, so that would always work. So you can have map and fold right if the functional argument comes first. So, which is um, maybe the killer app already of partial application. I mean, it happens from time to time that, um, yeah, this is a problem in, in practice, and then you have to work around it. Um, the main thing that happens in resource aware ML, where we have like, it's not quite that restrictive, but it's also like uh, has a similar restriction. Um, then sometimes your you know program doesn't type check. The, the resource ML would say like, okay, couldn't find a bound, and then you don't know why, and it's often like a partial application or something, and then it's a bit annoying. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Um, like, well, um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, but like, you could at least um, define something like append if you kind of like would switch the arguments, so then you can analyze it at least. Yeah, um, of course, in some you know useful program, you would say you want to do something with the appended list later on. Um, good. Um, so then you uh, might have a problem. Um, but um, if this is kind of like the result of your computation, if your program is only append, so then it would work. Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, let's maybe do um, one example. Um, One more example. Um, okay, so um, it's kind of like the hello world. Yeah, so kind of like a, a, a better identity function that is a bit cheaper. Uh, that only costs five when we call it. Um, so, okay, like this. And um, then, yeah, we can, uh, we have some flexibility what, what we can write here in the type. So, um, it's going to definitely look like this. Um, so, here we have to have five and zero because this is like the cost of the function body and yeah notice that like the cost that you have inside the function body here um, doesn't have um, anything to do with the cost you have here because like if you were to you know just evaluate this expression I mean it's a value you don't do anything so you don't have any cost there um, but then the uh, cost of the function body shows up here in the uh, on the arrow um, and um, we can also assign some potential to the list, but they're um, kind of like completely 
flexible so we can do something like okay we have 10 here and we get 10 yeah, and now we um, want to use the type rules to uh, type check it and um, oh yeah I'm, I'm I forgot to finish the type rules we also want to do the list but we don't oh yeah no we we need them here ha huh. we need at least um, one more rule, the rule for the tick. So yeah, I, I'm gonna come back to this example. Um, I wanna finish the type rules. So I got a bit um, distracted by your question. So um, let's go back to the type rules. So this is the one for, for lambda. So I wanna do now the remaining ones. These are the ones for the lists and for the tick. So the tick, um, let's maybe start with, with that one. Um, So, let's say we do a take off P again, the P could be negative. So, and then, yeah, we might have some cost in E, so we have some potential here, um, and then we use it to pay for the evaluation of E, and then we get some remaining potential. So, um, but then we still have to pay for the cost of this tick now. Yeah, so we have to have a little bit more here at the beginning, namely P. Um, this goes away as a cost for the tick, and Q is remaining, yeah, that we use to, to pay for the cost of E then. Yeah. And the context, we just pass all the potential on um, to it. So then the list rules. So the nil um, isn't too bad. So um, again, yeah, we um, are very restrictive here. We say we have to have zero, and afterwards we still have zero here. And um, now we have um, the list. Um, oh yeah, nil has always this annotation tau here. Oh well, yeah, so let's just say then we have tau here um, and we can um, add to it some potential, but it's a list of yeah, length zero, so it has always zero potential. So we can add an arbitrary um, Q here on the list and um, yeah, this is sound. I mean, we always have to watch out that we don't create um, potential out of nowhere, but this is not happening here because it has potential zero. So this is um, nice. Um, so even more interesting is the rule for the um, cons. So there we have to split up our context again because we have a, yeah, two sub-expressions. Um, E1 and E2. Okay. So, yeah, how is this going to work? So, um, here um, we have to first um, type the E1. So, oh, we first going to evaluate the E1, so we take um, the potential in gamma 1 um, along with Q, um, and um, yeah, what we will have as a result is a potential R, and the E1 has to have type tau. Okay, and then uh, we come to the E2, so now we thread our potential through here again, so we have the gamma 2, um, now we have the R, and yeah, kind of like what we want to end up with is, oh yeah, here this is supposed to be Q prime, I don't know what, why this prime is always sliding down. Um, so, um, but what we want to end up with here is something like Q prime and the E2, has to, of course, have the right list type. So, kind of like what's in the gamma two, yeah, so um, that has to um, pay 
for um, um, th what's in the, the gamma 2 and the R really has to pay for all the potential that gets stored up in this like resulting value here in the tail of the list, right? So, um, and the um, potential gamma 1 and Q here that kind of like is used to pay for everything that gets stored up in the head of the list could be another list, right? If it's a list of lists or something like that. But then there's still one thing missing because now the list gets you know, one element longer and so the, the head element also carries this potential P now that needs to come from somewhere. And so there are multiple possibilities where, where we can add it. So um, you could, for instance, say like, okay, we have to have it here at the beginning. Um, that would be one possibility. You could also say we have to have it here at the end. Uh, that would be another possibility. It doesn't really um, matter, I think. Yeah, for, yeah, it doesn't really matter. So, um, yeah, I think it might be, yeah, let's say we have it there. Why not? So, but yeah, we, this is kind of like some extra we need to pay for the growth of the list, yeah, because we have P per element. Um, so, right, and with a match, it's the opposite. So there, when we match on the list, and it's a head and a tail, we get this potential P out and can use it to pay for the cost um, that we have when we take this um, um, kind of like cons branch in the pattern uh, match. So, let's see. Look, so here's our pattern match. E one x one x two e two and the result is some type tau prime let's say um, good so the first thing we do um, is evaluate e so let's start with that one so we have uh, the potential in gamma one and q and we get some um, potential r back again and E of course has to be some list type L P of tau. So um, now um, what we do next really depends on um, what we get but here we in the analysis we have to account for both possibilities. So um, yeah, in the case we do the E1 yeah, um, and that E is nil, we can't really get any potential out of this list because yeah, it, it has length zero. So the only thing we really have is the potential in gamma 2 that we saved and the potential in R that we get back here. And we want to end up with Q prime and we want to end up with tau prime. So like this. Um, more interesting, of course, is um, the case um, where we have a, a, a list of lengths one or, or longer, and you know, where we have the cons case. So there, um, yeah, between the um, E1 and the E2, um, of course, we don't have to split up the context, right? Because we don't evaluate both, we evaluate either. So we can, you know, uh, we have this other case, so we can use the gamma 2 again here. Um, so what happens? So we do the, the match, so we get um, three things. So we get the um, head of the list, x1, that has the potential as uh, prescribed by tau, and then we get the tail, that has a potential as prescribed by LP of tau. And we also have this potential R still here. Um, and fortunately, we get the a potential P that was attached to the head. So that becomes available now, and we can use it to pay for some ticks um, that come maybe before the recurse ball or something. So here you get the P, and you have to end up uh, with Q prime still, and so we're typing E2 and also have to get tau. Yeah, so and this is kind of like the um, yeah, very kind of like key point here 
um, this um, kind of like uh, um, distribution um, of, of the potential from a data structure to this constant potential um, that is happening here and here like with the cons like in the other direction from the constant potential you take it and store it in the data structure. So these are um, really important rules. Yeah. Um, so that means um, you have p um, uh, units of potential per element in the list. Can y can't you just take, doesn't the tau also contain um, a potential? Yes, but th this one only contains potential um, for the uh, element itself. Okay, so there's Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So the, the tau kind of like tells you like if it were like a list of lists, yeah, what is the potential of the inner list? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, right, it's tau prime. Yeah, very good. You said that um, L applied to tau is equivalent, uh, LP applied to tau is equivalent to L applied to sort of angle brackets. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just like a, the one is like the abstract syntax, and this is kind of like the concrete syntax that is maybe a little bit easier to read. But like when I do tomorrow the recursive types, this other notation will prove useful. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay, so now this is all um, I have for the type rules. Um, now let's go back to um, our example that I wanted to do where I um, jumped ahead. Um, so now we want to do a type derivation here. So the first thing we have is um, the lambda abstraction. So now um, what we have to show is um, in a um, context where we have a list of potential 10 x and um, yeah now we have to see really what's written here on the arrow right because that's uh, what, what we're justifying so we start um, with five and end up with zero um, and um, the function body is just this take five x here okay doesn't seem too bad um, and um, what we get, or what we would like to get, is a list um, that has a potential 10 in the end. So then we have to look at the rule for um, the tick. So there we just um, type x. Um, under the same context gamma, which also just contains x here. And here we have to now subtract 5 as we go up, yeah, because we have to pay for the tick. And um, now we have to just apply the rule for the variables, and we are done. Okay, so that wasn't too bad, and so the, this kind of like uh, issue with uh, um, um, that we have to eliminate the potential, that we can't have potential in the context doesn't even show up here because we didn't have a context at the beginning. Yeah. So we have a closed expression. Um, so, um, but I mean, this type system as we have it now is extremely restrictive, so there's never any potential lost, really. Yeah, we want to do worst case bounds, so um, yeah, we could allow kind of like you know to 
say you start with much more than what you need, um, which um, sounds like, yeah, why would you do that? Well, for instance, if you have like a conditional or here you kind of like branch on a, on a list, you pattern match on a list, right? And then um, the two branches that you have, the cost um, is different. Right, so um, then you know what you're gonna do. You have to, in one of the branches, you have to throw away some potential, and why not? We can allow it and still be sound. Um, the same is true also, like if the potential is not just a constant potential, but like assigned to a list, right? You could also say, well, I have this list around here that carries a lot of potential, but I just don't want to use it, so you know I forget about it. This is not possible right now. So here, for instance, in this function, yeah, um, if you were to replace um, the x here with the empty list, yeah, you should kind of still be able to assign the, the same type. Yeah? So here, OK, we don't care. So um, this is fine still. Um, but the problem arises um, really here, where now we have the empty list here, and if you look um, at the rule for nil, where is it? Here. Oh, what did I do? Um, yeah, so I didn't want to have a context here. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, because we want to, to um, treat it uh, really like the um, 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 unit case that I probably also didn't write, so we don't allow uh, a context here. Um, so then um, you have a problem. You cannot apply this rule. Um, you have to have some kind of like form of uh, weakening that we are now going to add, where we say, like, yeah, OK, um, this is still fine. You can just throw away this potential you have stored in the argument. And um, you can um, type check nil. like this. So this is a rule we can introduce. Similarly, you know, you can also like throw away some constant potential that you have on the on the arrow. So this is something we can allow if we uh, want to have worst case bounds. So sometimes you want to be very precise and you want to, you, you don't want to allow this. You want to say, okay, we have the same cost um, on every branch we can possibly, on every pass, we can, we can take through the program. And this is interesting if you um, um, look at side channels um, and you want to say, like, okay, no matter you know, what the um, secret is, the cost is always the same on every pass. So this is also sometimes useful, but not for us here because we are doing worst case bounds. So yeah, the type rules you've seen so far, they are all um, syntax directed, so you have one rule for each uh, syntactic construct, which is good, um, yeah, good for um, type inference and type checking. Um, but now we're going to add some structural rules that you can apply to every expression. So the first one is the weakening rule. So if you uh, let's maybe do it top down. So if you derived something like this, so E has type tau prime and context gamma, then um, you can also just add like a new variable um, you know, with some type tau um, that you not going to use an E, and this is exactly the weakening rule we needed up here. Yeah. So, um, but it says basically it's like yeah, well, okay. So if you have like derived, um, you know, some um, um, bound that is kind of like defined by the potential in your context gamma, right? Then um, you can like make the bound a little bit larger and you know add something unrelated to it, and it's still an, an upper bound. So basically, what this says. And um, you can do the same also like with a Q. Um, so this is a rule we call weakening. And this one here we usually call relax. Um, so 
Yeah, let's say you derived already judgment for E with P and P prime, starting in the same context gamma, resulting in the same um, tau prime. So how um, can you weaken this so or relax it as as the name of the rule says. Well, first of all, you can start with a little bit more, so that should be fine, right? So if Q is greater or equal to P, so that should work. And then um, the Q prime, you could also just say like, oh, well, I had P prime left, but I throw a little bit out. Um, so you could say something like um, um, P prime is greater or equal to Q prime. Yeah, so that would be correct, but um, there's another thing we can do. We can always say um, we start with a little bit more and we end up with a little bit more. So, you know, if you derived um, um, here, let's say, yeah, if you look at this um, tick function here, it should be also fine to say like, oh, well, we, instead of five and zero, we want to start with 10 and end up with five. Yeah, so that seems to be also fine. And so um, what we say instead of this here is that the um, difference of Q minus Q prime has to be greater or equal than the difference between P uh, and P prime. So um, that kind of like supports this, like, yeah, you can add a, a constant to, to uh, both ends. Um, so this this one. Um, what you, yeah, question? Would the difference be absolute value, like if you were gaining resources, or are we assuming that they're all, um, you're not gaining resources? So, um, no, the, the, there's no assumption. So it could be that you, that you gain resources. So then you can still say, you know, you start with a little bit more than you kind of like end up with a little bit more. Um, doesn't matter really if you lose or gain. Oh, so, um, no, that, that's fine. So um, let's say kind of like, yeah, with a, um, here you kind of like, you know, gain um, five, so then um, this would be minus five, right? And then um, this would say in here um, with a Q, um, you have to gain a little less. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, you can't drop that because we are doing the high water mark, right? So if you, so there are really functions, right, where you um, first do a, a, a positive tick, and so first you do tick two, and then you do tick minus two, right? So then you really have to start with two and end up with two, but if you start with zero, it wouldn't work because you have to have two at the beginning. So. Yeah, you, you, you really need that. Um, if it were for, um, if, if you only consider time or something like that, then um, I think it would be fine, yeah, to, to have it if you're not, if you don't care about the high water mark. Yeah. Good, so, um, yeah, I'm wondering if we, should have a break now. Um, yeah, maybe let's do the break now and then um, in five minutes I talk about subtyping. So, okay, so let's continue. Um, so there are some, um, two more structural rules. So what you can also do is you can say like, okay, I um, have an expression of list type and you know it has potential 10, then I can also say like, okay, I, you know, in the same way here in the relax rule, where I say like, okay, I um, say, uh, well, I throw some of it away, I have a little bit less. You can also do that for a list, right? So if it has potential 10, you can also say, oh, well, never mind. So I only need potential five. So you can get rid of um, 
half of it. And so we're going to do that like with uh, subtyping. So the um, rule, subtyping rule is going to look like this. So we have the Q, Q prime E of um, some, um, oh, sorry, some type tau and um, or tau prime, let's do. And um, then um, if you um, derived same thing for a subtype, Oh, this is subtyping. I'll define it. Okay. Yeah, it's not yet defined. Okay. Yeah. So what what it uh, so what it means basically is um, yeah you can throw away some of the uh, potential right so you can kind of like lower the numbers a little bit so and um, the same thing works also the the other way around so if you have something in your context here um, then you can just say well. Um, use a little bit more um, potential um, than I really need. So here you have tau prime prime and I'll define the, the subtyping in a sec and here what you want is um, so the um, Tau prime. Uh, wait a sec. So the tau prime has to have um, more potential. So it's like this. No, the other way around. The tau has to have more potential. Sorry about that. Good. Um, Okay, and uh, right now we have to define what the uh, subtyping means. So, um, uh, tau is subtype of tau prime. So, yeah, so the um, most important one is um, the rule for the annotated type. So here, you have um, two types, tau and tau prime, with annotations q and q prime. And when is um, tau q a subtype of type tau uh, prime q prime? So when tau is a subtype of tau prime and q is greater or equal to q prime. Yeah, question? Um, oh, yeah, this was probably the, the question. Yeah, I forgot the prime here. Okay, so unit, the subtype of unit um, for the lists. It's called the, yeah, sorry, but crowded here. And um, the last one. As for the functions, that's what you um, would expect. So, so it's what covariant in the argument and contravariant, so it's flipped for the result.
Oh, it's just like the smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Smaller as in smaller and equal. Yeah. Yeah, and then the a colon after. Yeah. Okay, good. So, 20 minutes. I'm thinking about what to do. So, yeah, I wanted to show you a type derivation for the identity function, but this um, will take a lot of time. So, I rather will maybe skip this and um, talk about sharing. So um, let's say we were to um, define a, a double function. Sorry, yeah. Um, well, so um, because you can, I mean, so if something is like a subtype, so then um, it means um, you can, um, 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 oh well, if, or let's, yeah, so let's say so if something is a um, super type, right, then you can kind of like replace it on the uh, right side, so then kind of like, yeah, you, you make it weaker, so, and you make the um, function type weaker by saying, Oh yeah, wait a sec. Yeah, I think you. Oh yeah, no, I think you you're right. Yeah, I got it wrong. Yeah. I got it flipped. Yeah. Very good comment. Yeah. It's exactly like the normal one. Um, just got it flipped. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's just a normal one. Okay, so um, the example I want to do is a function that doubles the size of the list. So this is interesting for a couple of reasons. So um, let's do it for the um, unit list again. So I'll leave out the type here. The lambda. So if we have the empty list, then we just return the empty list and otherwise um, We want to take the head twice. So now, yeah, we have a problem because yeah, we can't really do that because our type system is affine. So when we were trying to, when we were try to type that, um, we would you know get to um, a spot where we would have in the context, you know, the double function and then we would have the y and the y's. So. And then we, we want to type this. And now we have to kind of split up our context, right? If you remember the the rule for cons, well, it's still um, up on the board here. Yeah, so we have to find um, our split um, into um, gamma 1 and gamma 2, and we can't really do that here because the y we need on both sides. We need that the tail. Yeah, here, this is the tail. Um, 
and we also need it for the head, so we can't really type this function. Um, even though it um, seems to be completely fine to do that, because I mean the only um, yeah, problem we have is if we were to duplicate any potential, which is not the case here, yeah, because unit doesn't carry any potential, so it should be totally fine um, to use it twice. Even if it were to carry potential, so if you you know, um, think of a, um, um, a function like this. So another example. Um, so where we um, yeah, let me maybe write down the type here. So unit list. And we um, were now to to use x twice um, here. So yeah, if you remember, like for the ID, it, we needed to have two potential units um, on x. Um, so here the um, kind of like yeah, what we would need here for this argument is four, right? So it seems to be kind of like fine to do that um, as long as we somehow account for the fact that we use it twice. Yeah? So you cannot just you know, say like, okay, you can use it twice and still pay two. You have to somehow um, account for it. And this is what we do with sharing. So this function we, we cannot type, but so we introduce a new syntactic construct um, that we call share and that will allow us to do that and it will take care of um, distributing the potential correctly. So here, um, so the, I should say the type that we want for it, um, for, for this function is, um, what well, something like this, right? Four units per element, zero, zero, and then they are used up. And um, what we have to do then is to right, share x as x1 x2 in this expression, and then we have to say this is x1, this is x2, and the type rule for this share construct will tell us how to split up the potential. So here we'll just say, okay, you have potential four um, on this list x, so then you can just split it into um, potential two for x1 and potential two for x2 um, yeah, per element in these two lists, and um, you didn't gain anything. Yeah. And for the unit and like the double function, yeah, you also can like freely share it. And for functions, you can also freely share it. So the rule sharing looks as follows. But well, first um, we say like, okay, we have this new construct, right? So. Share e x1, x2, e2, or e1, I usually say. Um, so this is um, like a let, basically. Yeah, the concrete syntax is up here. Write it again. Share e s x1, x2, 1. And two, so this is not a good pen. So the um, dynamics of this sharing construct. find as follows. So you just evaluate the E1 
till you have a value. So Yeah, this is like before. So, and once you have a value, then you substitute for both variables. and the E2, of course. So this is the dynamics of it. And um, the statics, so there will be a, another new symbol that will um, be a bit more exotic than the subtyping. So here again we have to split our context. Okay. Um, so first, um, we're going to evaluate the E, the uh, E1, sorry. It has some type tau that can, of course, now carry the potential. And then we want to continue with the gamma 2 and the potential P. We want to end up with Q prime um, that we want to have left over at the end. Oh, sorry. Of course, the main thing now is um, we have x1 of tau1, x2 of type tau2. So still p goes to q prime. And e has e2 has to have type tau prime. So and um, yeah, now there should be of course some relationship um, between the tau one, tau two, and tau, and this is um, what we define with a sharing relation. So this is a um, bizarre symbol yeah, that we use. It says type tau is shared as tau one and tau two. And this is simply taking all the annotations on the um, lists and splitting them up, uh, basically. So where should we put it? Um, maybe here. So maybe start with an example that will maybe give you most of the info already. So what we want is basically if you have a list of lists, okay, like this, um, then you want to be able to share it, and you can decide now how you you know split the things up individually. So you can maybe say, okay, um, all potential of the inner lists goes to the first one. This one is tau1, basically. 
and so the tau two gets two of the outer list, but nothing of the inner list. Yeah, so this is um, the kind of thing we want to define. Um, and um, yeah, what's important is that like for um, function types, we have no restriction really, so um, we can freely share them. No subscript, so you can just say uh, you can use it twice. You don't have to um, do anything special, right? So the um, if it if the tau is an error type for for the e1 there, then um, you can just use the same error type for the tau one and tau two. So that's important. Um, so this is a rule here. Um, so and now comes the rules. Um, yeah, you have the same one for a unit. I'm not writing it down. So, but like, uh, if it um, comes to a list, so then um, we have to do something. So, so you can share it if the A shares with. A1 and A2, and um, then the, the rule where um, the mass happens is always the one for these annotated types, right? So here we have tau1, q1, tau2, q2, and yeah, you. Um, can maybe tell me what to do with the Qs. So we have to share tau with tau1 and tau2. And what has to hold for the Qs here? Q equals Q1 plus Q2. Exactly. Q equals Q1 plus Q2. That's it. So this is the uh, sharing. Okay, so I wanted to um, also um, talk a bit about the soundness, but um, maybe you know I can um, give you some homework first. So um, okay, um, give. Uh, Type derivation for what should we do? So I want to, you know, put this double function to some uh, good use. So um, for the following term, so where you. You see, identity function so that we have some cost because on the double function we didn't have any ticks even. So double x. Yeah, so that's a good exercise um, to work out. Uh, yeah. Pun, why is it? Oh, the example. So, yeah, so the, the cues you share is so you have one um, for the outer lists that you split up. So, here this four um, goes to this two and this two, and here this one goes to the inner ones. All right, so zero plus two is two. You can also split it up in a different way. Uh, you could say, oh, well, I want to put zero here and two here. Um, that would also work as long as it adds up. Uh, you could also do one and one. Yeah. So the, the inner lists have their, their own potential, and you can also share it. And um, 
Yeah, it's also, I mean, so yeah, we didn't talk about that um, enough um, because we only had these simple examples, but it's really powerful um, what you get from that. So for instance, you think of a program where you have like, you know, all, um, 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 first, you know, you um, append, so you have a list of lists, you append all the inner lists, and then you feed it into some function um, that has um, um, a cost. Uh, so then you get like really a bound um, that tells you like, okay, you know, the um, 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 cost is bounded by the sum over all the lengths of the inner list. So it's a, it's a very precise thing. And in resource aware ML, where you have polynomial bounds, you even get like a you know very precise bound for like yeah, append all the inner lists and feed into quick sort, right? So then you get the exact kind of like quadratic um, um, bound for that contains all the individual sizes of the inner lists. So it's um, quite powerful. So um, and sometimes, so that's not even so nice to report for, for, for to a user. Sometimes it really helps you to get asymptotically better bounds than if you were to abstract um, um, the length of the inner list with one number. Um, okay, so last thing for today. Um, almost out of time. Um, at least want to write down the progress and preservation um, theorems that I came up with, so I guess we don't need the rules anymore. So where's my cleaner? Do I even have another full? So, um, yeah, so the progress theorem is not difficult to prove at all. So it's basically like the regular progress theorem. So if we have a, a closed expression E of type tau, um, where Q um, is a bound um, on the high water mark now, um, yeah, because we don't have any other potential, and P is greater or equal to Q, then either E is already a value or um, E and you know, P resources available, we can step to some um, E prime, P prime. Okay, and preservation is, is progress, and preservation is difficult to prove. Yeah, progress is really simple because, like in most of the cases, the p prime is just the p, right? Because it does only change in in the tick, and um, if you have the tick case, um, then it's also um, clear. Um, do we still have the the rule for the tick somewhere? Nope. Um, yeah, because then you can just see in the rule of the tick, right, we had on um, top of the turnstile, we had Q plus P, yeah, where P was the, the thing you consumed. So you know right away, okay, you have, you know, enough available to make a step. So it's, it's really easy to prove. What's difficult to prove really is a preservation. Um, and um, so let me just state it. So if... Um, You have a closed expression E again, as before, of type tau. P is greater than Q. And um, we make a step to E prime, P prime. Yeah, then um, what is true? So then, um, of course, we 
expect um, E prime to have the same type tau, but um, of course, yeah, now the kind of like cost bound should be potentially less since we had some, you know, potential consumed in, in that step. Um, but yeah, so um, I'll just. Next lecture, and then I'll show you the um, alternative soundness theorem. Okay, yeah, thanks.